The Incredibles, one of Pixar's classic film. Rewatching for the sequel, there's a lot of things that I enjoy from the first movie. How would it depict a real family where it doesn't feel like a full house family? Parents argue, children fight each other, and worrying about their parents' relationship, leading to ideas of divorce. The world building is also interesting as well, with superheroes forced to be in hiding because people keep constantly suing them for saving them. But what really holds it together is how well you can relate to the characters in this film, which leads us to a sequel. With the same Ryan director being in charge of this project, you'd think he would do a good job of making a really good sequel, but it turns out to be more disappointing than anything else, which we will examine. The plot of this film is directly after the end of the first film, where you get to see them finding the undermining. Even though they successfully stopped the drill from causing interfering damage, however, this angered authorities and convinced politicians to terminate the hero hiding program. With nowhere else to go, it seemed like the family could be on the streets, Bob, Ernie, and Kirk comes to help them by wanting to reintroduce supers back to the public. The best way to start is with Elastigirl representing the campaign, which creates two plots about Elastigirl doing hero work leading to the discovery of Screen Slaver, and Mr. Incredible is dealing with the struggles of raising three kids. And that's pretty much the synopsis for the plot, but the problem is like heavily on the characters and the direction of the story. Essentially, Mr. Incredible gets shown on this film, somehow he feels weaker compared to the last film. It's as if he received a massive nerf for this movie, where he starts to push a bowler despite being able to do bench work with a train. He also gets defeated in the 1v1 against Undermine, like Mr. Incredible was able to beat robots created by Syndrome over 6 months, yet he struggles against a dude with a fisting glove. Also, Underman escapes and never comes back to the film. His whole purpose was to create the plot for the sequel. And that's just the surface levels of the problems. The more lines underneath his character, because when Helen was chosen to kickstart the campaign, he begins to get jealous over his wife because he wants to be a hero instead. This honestly sounds more like a kid than anything else. I know in the last film, he wanted to be a hero so badly he did vigilante work, which eventually led him unknowingly to work for Syndrome. But he learned his lesson for worrying about his own desires after he thought his whole family got killed in the plane explosion, realizing how much of a lousy parent he is and should focus more on his family. One of the lines that cements this is when he says my greatest adventure was raising this family, which says a lot about his character. Instead, the sequel undermines that when Frozen told him he discovered a corporation called DevTech and wants to recruit and bring back superheroes to the public. Instead of being guilty of this prospect, he should be more defensive about it because the last time he joined a corporation, he almost got his family killed. Even though Francis said he checks out, he still should be worrying more about his family's safety than being a hero. Nope, he's back to being selfish again, getting jealous of hearing his wife doing amazing hero work. So the rest of the story is him trying his best to raise his kids, only for more problems to arise where, where Vi's anger as her father for letting Dicker erase Tony completely from his memory because she accidentally found her secret identity. Uh, don't worry, we'll talk about that later. Struggling to understand Dad's math homework and having a hard time keeping Jack Jack powers in check to the point where it's all too much for him and blows up in front of his children, but eventually he ruins the value of a family after Violet forgives her father. Honestly, this movie did him dirty for making him act like this, reteaching him the lesson he already learned in the first movie. Undermine his whole apology speech. Next is Violet because she gets a bit of a character change from the sequel. Because when finally Undermine her, Dash went to join the action, leaving her with Jack Jack, disgusted to be so angry that she removes her own mask, leading to Tony seeing her identity. This feels so forced, so just so they can do a soft reset for their relationship and create problems for Bob. Violet has been in more stressful situation during the plane explosion and Syndrome's Island because she had a hard time using her powers, especially in a stressful situation, making her less confident in herself. Towards the end of the movie, where she became more confident after saving her family with her powers and asking out Tony on a date. What makes it worse, instead of being responsible for her own actions, she rather blamed her father for letting Dick erase Tony completely. So, she gives him a difficult time about it. Even at the end, instead of apologizing her father, he apologizes to her instead. She also learns to take care of Jack Jack when they fight crime, since she protects him with her bubble shield, as if it wasn't obvious. As for our new characters, Bob, Erdenkirk, and his sister, Evelyn. Essentially, their mission is to get Elastigirl to be popular among the populace, which her first ever hero work was stopping a newly built train and saving the ambassador's life from a helicopter attack. While watching, you're thinking, man, isn't it a coincidence that she managed to save a train, giving her the popularity, and managed to rescue an ambassador that likes heroes, kicks on the process of making them legal? Whatever you think is not the case, because pick any one of these people on the screen who's the villain. Here's a hint. It's not Bob Erdenkirk. 
Yes, of course, it's Anna. So it's his sisters doing it behind his back and makes no sense once I explain her motivation. Essentially, they kind of just waste Bob Erdenkirk in this film, since all he does is being good to talking with people and simping for heroes. Evelyn, despite seeming like she's gonna be good friends with Helen, turns out to be a twist villain. As says we couldn't get enough of it back in the 2010s. So what's her motivation in being an evil baddie? Well, when their parents' house got invaded, their father tried to call supers for help, but the law was already in effect, making heroes illegal. And to be honest, most likely Gage Beam is mostly dead by this point. As for the other guy, he mostly got killed in the cable incident since he wasn't in the last film. In trying to call supers for help, instead of going to the panel room, he gets killed for it. This causes Evelyn to despise heroes because people overly rely on them, making them lazy to fend for themselves. And this also correlates in technology because despite making advanced technology, she also hates it because it also makes people lazy, since it used to make their lives easier. To be fair, it was her dad's character being overly obsessed that caused him to die. So her master plan is to make heroes appear villains by mind controlling them, using heroes to hijack a boat and smash onto the city, with all the world representatives trying to legalize heroes, which gets foiled. Honestly, I don't know where to begin with this one, so let's start with her motivation. One of the most dumbest desires I ever heard. The idea that civilians rely on heroes too much could work on our superhero shows, but not in this universe, because it was the same civilians that the supers rescued constantly to be outlawed since they were constantly sued for exaggerated reasons. To the point I wouldn't be surprised that heroes were scared and saving someone because they might get sued for grabbing them too tightly. Her argument that people should defend for themselves is also stupid. How the hell you can defend yourself against a giant robot where the military was ineffective in slowing it down? The Underminer or this poor dude getting mugged in the streets. I mean, I guess he was hoping that a hero would have saved him by her logic. What makes it worse is that she won't help solve this problem anyways because she thinks technology is also bad. So she won't bother making any inventions to help them stop crime. Her whole motivation sounds like someone caught up smelling their own thoughts thinking they're intellectual. You want to hear the saddest part? Syndrome was willing to create devices to make everyone super so that no one would be special after stopping the robot. See, essentially a watered down version of Syndrome, and that's me putting it nicely. Her making the last girl stop in and saving the ambassador also doesn't make any sense. Why give her a warning at Screen Slayer? She hopes she will fail? That's why I honestly believe it was Bob Erdenkirk and Evelyn working together doing evil things to get heroes back, essentially making themselves villains, but nope. As for the rest of the cast, everyone pretty much just relatively remained the same except for one, which I'll explain in a bit. Dash is, well, Dash. The last girl is pretty much doing more of what she did in the first film, and Frozen, well, he's still cool. As for the new generation of heroes, they're just there to be obstacle layered down towards the end. Their designs also doesn't look like they belong in this universe, and one of them is a blue hair super that her name is Karen, which almost made me quit watching this movie. Essentially, there's two plots for this film, story being the last girl's adventures and Mr. Incredible taking care of the kids. The last girl part wasn't very much entertaining compared to the last film, because yes, it was fun seeing her use her bike in creative ways and do an investigation on her own, but I was expecting to see a sequel of the family working together as a team and less working by themselves, like the ending where the car turns into the Invincible Beetle. I want to see a whole movie about that, and Emily being involved in the plot only contributed to make it worse. As for the B-plot of the movie, despite how much I didn't like the direction of Vida and Mr. Incredible's character, there is one saving grace for this plot, and that is Jack-Jack. This character that barely had any screen time single-handedly carried this movie for me. Just like how the last girl stole the third act for the film, Jack Jack did the same for this. What made it entertaining seeing the other characters react to his powers, being absolutely terrified of this creature, and at the same time seeing the family having fun with Jack Jack using him as a laser gun before the boys made it terrifying. Easily the best scene of this film is Jack Jack finding a raccoon that had nothing to do with the plot, to the point I'm convinced that the sequel should have been about him. The direction of the sequel seems what makes this film a mess, where in the beginning of the movie, it just doubles down on how authorities and government hate supers, seem like they popularly hate supers as well. Later down in the film, everyone likes supers, hell, before Elastigirl saved the ambassador's life, she was simping for her. I feel like the movie shouldn't have some kind of government character, or better yet, a military hard-ass general who hates supers because he believes that the army should defend the populace from outside threat, not them. But no, instead we got brain dead Evelyn to be the villain for this film. Also, the movie has all terms because it seems everyone forgot about all the things that happened in the last film. Like, no one mentioned that the super stopped a robot that military couldn't even slow down. 
Hasil Drum even existed. I noticed the deleted scene that gave a nod to it, but that doesn't count since it wasn't part of the final product. It makes me question Brad Bird's direction of this film because it isn't as tightly written compared to his other's work. Maybe they didn't get as much effort into this one, Disney could have seen the control over this film, or maybe Brad Bird enters enters Uber Driver wrote this film. I really don't know. What I can say is that there was many different directions it could have gone. A whole movie at Jack Jack, seeing the family working together, fun scenes like Mr. Crow being that terrifying dad girlfriend towards Tony. Instead, it essentially repeats itself of the family learning to work together again, redoing Mr. Incredible story and finally getting the confidence to ask out Tony again. At the same time, breaking characters, wasting potential ideas just for this story to happen. That's why I consider Incredible to a disappointing sequel. It could really recapture the magic of the first film, because you could see some of the ideas throughout the movie, but it essentially wastes every single one of them. Thanks for watching and bye.